so um, you know our our next speaker, uh, Professor Yuval Degan from Technion, is a dear friend and collaborator, and um, you know we've worked together on this resonant tunneling diode idea. Um, but you know, interestingly, we first met Yuval at the first Advanced Propulsion and Energy IAP that took place in person at MIT. And we had put up posters all over the place. And he happened to see one of the posters in, I think, a place where he didn't normally ever go. And he happened to see a poster. And he showed up. And um, just our work together ever since has been really beautiful. So to me, it's one of the best outcomes of these events that has ever happened. And, uh, you know, it's just an example, I think, of how powerful these sort of gatherings can be in forming collaborations and furthering the work along. So really looking forward to Yuval's talk and, and thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you, you took away my introduction to the talk because I, I, I this, this was exactly what I wanted to say the first time uh, I was in this uh, event. Uh, amazing, really. Uh, should I share my presentation? Then? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, put, uh, go ahead and share. Yeah, I'll do it in a second. So uh, yeah, and I, I didn't mean to take away your intro. So please. Uh, no, it, it's uh, amazing, really, because it's uh, it's it's not surprising, but uh, we do think alike. And um, first of all, hello everyone. Uh, it's very very good to be here. Um, and thank you, Charles and Kate, for this uh, for inviting me to the IAP. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be a part of it. In this workshop always feels like a um, very rare opportunity to connect with so many open-minded people. Um, so thanks. Uh, I, I did have, I have the chance to participate in the in-person first workshop uh, at MIT, which uh, certainly changed the trajectory of my uh, studies, but also my thoughts, uh, probably more important than everything else so for me it's uh, very special uh, so thanks again and uh, so for today's talk um, I want to talk about classical interpretations of the boy meta waves and um, this is an ongoing project which I started uh, a couple of years ago maybe three years ago uh, when I was a postdoc at uh, the mathematics department at uh, MIT uh, where I was working with uh, Professor John Bush. And I was lucky enough not only to work with him, with John, uh, about this problem, but also try to implement um, his new ideas at the time. Um, so what I will show you today is uh, mo most of them is, is this, is what uh, we've been doing um, for the last couple of years. And, uh, and this uh, ongoing collaboration is uh, also wonderful and uh, we, we hope to continue. Uh, I will also talk about some new ideas and new ventures uh, uh, here, we do here in the lab uh, to explore um, maybe the more realistic uh, interpretations uh, based on De Broglie's ideas, uh, which are not new for sure, but I believe uh, everything we do now uh, in quantum mechanics is related to uh, the same basic ideas. Um, so I'm Yuval uh, from the Department of Aerospace Engineering at Technion. And um, first of all, I want to acknowledge um, some people that I've been working with uh, recent years. So John Bush for our last uh, past and ongoing work on our new pilot wave model that I'll show you today, which we call the HQFT. Uh, Mark Fleury um, for his support during my postdoctoral studies at MIT. Without his support, 
I wouldn't um, be able to show you uh, this work. And of course, my friend Charles Chase for everything we did uh, and will do. I really hope we will do this experiment. It's a, it's a dream come true, even if, if it doesn't work. Uh, it will show us something, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes, yes. We just, we, just need, we just need the opportunity to do so. And there are a lot, a lot of things to, to try, right? Yes. Uh, so, so we should definitely do that. Uh, this work uh, with Charles uh, was supported by Sony White and the Limitless Space Institute. So thank you, Sony. I don't know if uh, he's here today. Um, but also, without the support of um, the other things I'm doing here in the, in the lab, I wouldn't be able to do that. So uh, Israeli Science Foundation um, is supporting me for work on particle interactions and flow instability, which is very much related to the work I'm doing here as well. Uh, and the Center for Security Science and Technology uh, of the Technion. Uh, so, um, Last thing I wanted to show you before I start my talk is uh, our group. This is an old picture. Um, it's very hard to um, to collect everyone these days with all those uh, quarantines. Uh, so, uh, but I'm very proud, uh, proud of my uh, group. So here in the Technion, here you can see the Technion. Can you see my score, um, the cursor? Or, yeah. Can you see the cursor? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, here, uh, this is Technion, and our department sits right here in the middle of the woods, which is uh, rare uh, to find this uh, uh, green campus in the Middle East. But uh, this is our department. And uh, here uh, in our lab, we combine theory, high fidelity computations, and experiments to reveal some fundamental principles of uh, flow processes. And that usually involves some flow instabilities, waves, and interacting particles. So this is the relation I'm doing between my uh, uh, usual or regular work uh, with those uh, analogies that I'll show you today. Uh, so the outline for today's talk, um, I'm going to start to talk about the high dynamic analog just a little bit and uh, the Broglie theory. Uh, then uh, I want to show you the main topic, uh, which is the hydronomic quantum field theory. It's a hydronomic in, uh, inspired um, field theory, um, which is based on, uh, on De Broglie's ideas. And uh, I'm, I'm going to show you uh, the steady motion, uh, free particle, and some uh, results for force particle. And finally, if I have some time, I'll, I really want to show the new work we've been doing on classical interpretation, um, totally classical interpretations, uh, which shows some interesting relativistic uh, quantum dynamics. Uh, so I want to start with the high dynamic analog. So I, I don't know if um, you're aware of this uh, analog, but it's a beautiful system uh, of uh, fluid mechanics where you have uh, here, uh, we vibrate the bath of uh, oil in this case, silicon oil. And here you can see a drop, a droplet that bounces on an air cushion uh, and creates those uh, beautiful waves. Um, interestingly, uh, if we increase the amplitude of those, uh, those waves, we can have uh, a walking droplet, uh, you can see here. And those droplets, they bounce and interact with your own uh, wave field. Uh, there's an intrinsic memory in the system, which is induced by the waves uh, the droplet themselves uh, create. So, um, and John Bush will be talking about it uh, in much more details. So just uh, very quickly, I want to show that uh, this system, although macroscopic, um, reveal some non-local dynamics based on the interactions of um, the droplet with its own uh, memory coming from the field, from those wave fields. And um, uh, most important here in this analogy is that droplets exhibit multiple quantum mechanical features in the microscopic uh, scale. So this is definitely not a 
quantum mechanical system, definitely not in the scales. Um, but here, for example, we can see the corral, the quantum corral. Um, on the right, uh, you can see um, the famous Chromese paper showing a PDF of the sea of uh, electrons excited by STM. And you can clearly see those waves. So basically, basically placing add atoms, surface atoms, um, metal surface atoms um, in a circle. This is a corral. And you get those uh, waves excited in the, um, uh, which, uh, in which you don't have any, any disturbance. So these are the Bohr waves. In the same manner, uh, we can see the same wave-like statistics or very similar statistics emerge from the droplet form, a walking droplet when bounded by uh, boundaries or a corral. And this is the work of uh, uh, Bush and, uh, and co-workers. So this is the really, um, really a short uh, uh, introduction to the high dynamic analog. But I want to continue and talk about the Broglie's idea, uh, ideas uh, from 1924. And De Broglie introduced the idea that uh, a particle has associated with it an intrinsic clock. So some intrinsic uh, vibration. Uh, obviously, we all know this. So particles at rest, we can write the Einstein energy uh, equation for uh, particle at rest, E equals mc squared, which is also h bar omega. Uh, and here, this omega for particles at rest uh, is the Compton frequency, omega c. Uh, when set in motion, uh, this equation takes this form, boosted, um, this is a relativistic boost, uh, due to the motion of, uh, of the particle. So mass is boosted. And this is the Broglie's relation, p equals h bar k. Which, uh, so both of uh, those equations, um, uh, from both we can get the famous Einstein's uh, energy equation for a relativistic particle. Now when quantized, um, we can uh, immediately get the Klein-Gordon equation as the wave function. So this is a relativistic particle field equation uh, that we look at. Now, quite interesting to explore this um, equation. Uh, this is a dispersion relation of matter waves. And on the other hand, if we uh, talk about water waves, for example, we can also write a very similar equation uh, with a similar dispersion relation, although not exactly the same. And now this is the dispersion relation for deep gravity capillary water waves, where we have the same uh, k here, k is wave number, omega is frequency, uh, g here is the gravity, sigma is surface tension, and rho is density. So definitely not the same, uh, not the same uh, form, but uh, interesting uh, to note that the high dynamic uh, analogy is uh, mostly um, uh, characterized by a monochromatic wave, which means this k here is roughly constant. If it is constant, then we can do uh, uh, some uh, comparison between those two. Now, De Bruyne's postulate is that a particle at rest is associated with an oscillation at the Compton frequency, which was uh, which is this frequency here. If you look at this equation and think about uh, some kind of a resonator um, coupled in space but with a natural frequency, frequency of the Compton uh, frequency. What uh, he did not say, so a particle may, may exchange rest mass energy with the wave energy, but De Broglie did not specify a waveform uh, for, uh, for this particle. Uh, instead, uh, De Broglie suggested some uh, simple mechanical model, but did not actually specify uh, it's uh, it's wave. So this is something we want to examine or explore using our knowledge in uh, the high dynamics. Uh, so continuing with De Broglie's idea, um, so particular motion and the harmony of phases 
uh, this is his great idea. Um, and here I'm, I'm quoting uh, something that I liked. This is not for, uh, coming from a book and uh, it's just from an interview which is very simply said that, uh, I, I think it from the 70s, maybe 1970 or 1967, when the Broy said, well, in French, this is a translation, uh, I think the theory of relativity plays a major role, much greater than most people usually think, in the basic ideas of wave mechanics, and that if one wants to really understand its origins, one has to come back to relativistic uh, considerations. So I wanted to put it here because I think this is what we're looking for in this workshop as well. Uh, we really want to understand the origins. Um, so what, what, what De Broglie suggested is that the phase of those waves, because it's a scalar, the phase should not change when you, um, when you change the frame of reference, right? So in one frame of reference, you have a frequency, uh, which is decreased due to time dilation which is a redshift, relativistic redshift. On the other hand, uh, on, the, uh, on another frame of reference, you have frequency increase due to uh, increased mass, right? So this is a boost uh, of, uh, of frequency. When you combine both, you get a phase velocity, which is six squared over VP. So I'll get back to this. Now, if we assume a simple phase, uh, monochromatic uh, phase uh, of the wave. And uh, so, so we can take this and pretty quickly see that um, the momentum of a particle is gradient driven by uh, the gradients of the phase uh, from which we get uh, P equals H bar K. So this is just a very simple, um, um, very simply showing uh, De Broglie's uh, main ideas. Uh, now, notably for uh, monochromatic waves, the, uh, in Klein-Gordon, the phase is comparable to the wave's amplitude. And uh, we show this in a paper we published uh, not long ago. Um, now, another interesting thing is that if we take the Klein-Gordon as a uh, um, by the way, uh, De Broglie said, uh, himself suggested that uh, the field um, may be used, uh, so we may, we, we may use the Klein-Gordon field uh, in this, uh, um, um, uh, uh, for, for the interaction of particle du um, duality. And, and so this is what we're doing here. We're taking Klein-Gordon and uh, here we have the bouncing droplet. But if we stroke the bouncing droplet in the high dynamic uh, analog, we see uh, that the, so we, we can actually see the motion of the droplet here dressed by this, uh, um, uh, by, by this uh, wave field, which really seems uh, stationary. And uh, we'll get back to that uh, also. So when we take the Klein-Gordon equation and uh, modulate it or strobe it, at the Compton frequency, we actually get the Schrodinger's equation with um, an additional relativistic term that you can see here. Um, so, but we ask ourselves, uh, how would an oscillating disturbance like the, this bouncing droplet will affect the generation of waves? So this is our research question. Um, now, so we want to propose a new hydrodynamically inspired uh, pilot wave model. Now, there has been recent pilot wave models for quantum dynamics inspired by the walking droplet system. Uh, probably most notably is uh, the HQA itself. Um, so um, you can refer to those uh, papers here. This is by John and um, um, also, I want to note some uh, very uh, interesting uh, recent papers by Borghese, um, Dreze. Um, uh, so this is interesting. So this is a mechanical analog of quantum gradients and uh, superluminal tachyons uh, based on Klein-Gordon equation. 
uh, also a classical classical uh, analogy. Um, bound states by Shinbrot and uh, and very recent work by Valani uh, and co-workers on the unsteady dynamics of classical particle wave entity. So I think this field is uh, emerging very nicely. Now. Uh, uh, I want to I want to show you now our model, and this is another quotation by Olan. Uh, this is from his book from 1995, where he says that we can think about a more active role of the particle, something which is not uh, conceivable in conventional views. And um, uh, and he actually uh, suggested to end uh, uh, so the uh, the way we can think about this particle as enter as a source of this violet wave field, uh, and this is exactly what we want to do here. So this is our model, and uh, in our model, uh, the first equation is the Klein-Gordon field. Uh, forced by a localized uh, delta function or a Gaussian, uh, but it's uh, it's oscillating. So we have this um, function of time. So we have an oscillating source. Uh, we take this as a Gaussian, localizing this uh, perturbation about the particle. Uh, but note that this Gaussian is actually infinite, right? Uh, also a delta function, but it's really localized. But the Gaussian is infinite, which is kind of interesting because uh, um, De Broglie himself suggested that a particle um, influence, influence is infinite in space, but localized. So this, uh, in a way, continues De Broglie's um, um, initial ideas. Now what we do here is we take this equation and now we coupled it to a relativistic uh, dynamic equation for a particle, right? Uh, so here we can see the gamma, it's a boost. Um, um, uh, the Lorentz uh, boost uh, factor. And here this is, this is basically uh, gamma V is uh, basically the, uh, the momentum, which is also gradient driven by local, local uh, um, uh, um, by the fields uh, which are excited locally about the particle location. Um, another inter interesting thing we do here is uh, that we take this uh, harmonic uh, function to be twice the natural, uh, natural frequency of, of the system, which is twice the constant frequency. Um, we do that because uh, the droplet system is parametrically excited exactly in the same way. So in the droplet system, we vibrate the bath at uh, twice the farther frequency. Here we do the same, but at this Compton frequency. But why should we do that for uh, quantum dynamics? Why should it work? Um, Schrodinger suggested uh, uh, that this trembling motion of a particle or uh, this clock we talked about is actually uh, oscillating at twice the Compton frequency, which he um, coined as the Zitterbewegung or the trembling motion of the particle. And this was amazing to see after we decided to do this because we saw it from the hydronomic uh, uh, analogies. <laughs> but it's just fun. Um, so this is what we're doing. Ah, and in um, uh, in uh, in um, uh, a paper by uh, Dury and Bush, uh, they actually show that um, uh, uh, exciting uh, this system, uh, the same Klein-Gordon system with twice the Compton frequency, leads to the um, to the um, uh, um, uh, quantum uh, uh, emergence, uh, emergence of uh, quantum statistics and the most uh, excited states. Um, and everything is here in our uh, papers published in CRM. So this is what we're doing. We're actually, uh, we can actually solve this, uh, wait, sorry. So we can actually solve this system now 
uh, we have an oscillating particle that creates uh, some localized wave fields and a dynamic equation for the particle. So what I want to show you first is this. So this is a kinematic simulation where um, we want to explore the waveforms emerging from uh, steady moving particles. So this is not a coupled system. We have, we have, um, uh, we prescribe here the particles, uh, particle velocity, particle speed, which can, you can see here in black. So we're just prescribing zero particle here. This is spatial temporal map. And here in red and blue, you can see the, those waves. Uh, here in C, this is the speed of light, a light cone, if you wish. And here in the bottom, we can see um, the uh, amplitude of the waves. And this is the spatial uh, coordinate normalized by the Compton wavelength. So this is for zero. We can see that the particle actually creates standing waves, which is also what uh, De Broglie suggested. Now, when the particle moves, uh, this is the waveform we get. Uh, now, again, particle is in black. We're now prescribing a motion of uh, beta, which is uh, the particle speed over C, which is 0.7. Um, so at 0.7, this is the motion of a particle in black. And what you can see that we have those uh, slanted um, waves here. This is not slanted waves that are actually, um, this, this is actually the phase velocity of the wave we can measure. Uh, now, if we can, uh, we can actually measure those uh, wavelength, right? Uh, which we call lambda b, which is two pi over uh, wave number. We measure this. And, uh, and then we can extract KB. Now, if we have KB, we can now, um, we can now um, uh, estimate what, what, what the, um, the actual momentum will be, which is h bar k, right? Gamma is missing here. So it's gamma h bar k. Um, so very interesting uh, uh, to see if it works. And in yellow, you can see that it works. So we're measuring the particle. Um, um, uh, measuring the wavelength about the particle movement, we can actually uh, reproduce p equals h bar k. Um, yeah, so if you remember the strobing of the, the bouncing droplet, when we strobe the bouncing droplet, we saw this uh, wave dressing uh, the droplet, which seems um, a stationary wave. I, um, uh, walking with the droplet. And this is exactly what we see here when we strobe this constant moving particle. So exactly the same wave again and again, strobing it at the Compton frequency. And here we can see the same effect, but uh, not, from, uh, not for uh, beta 0.7, but uh, other, uh, other um, velocities. And we can see uh, basically an oscillating particle that induces uh, long waves at the De Broglie wavelength. Um, this is due to relativistic Doppler effect, but it also produces short waves at a scale comparable to the Compton wavelength. Now here we let the particle do whatever it wants. So before we prescribe the motion, now it's a free particle, quantum signature, and self-propulsion is uh, evident. So let's see how, how we see that. Um, so this is again a spatial temporal, uh, spatial temporal map. This is space and this is time. These are the waves. And at first we have a particle just um, bouncing or oscillating, right? And creating standing waves, right? Uh, now we perturb the system with an initial very small perturbation, a random perturbation for the particle. Uh, and this perturbation is actually um, uh, increasing over time. The system becomes unstable. This region here, in this region here, the, symmet the symmetry is broken and the particle starts to move. This region is a chaotic region uh, um, uh, coming uh, from this nonlinear system. But uh, surprisingly, this, uh, from this chaos, um, coherent structure 
emerge and the particle locks into a quasi-steady quasi uh, motion. Now, again, if we measure uh, this um, uh, wavelength here, close to this particle uh, motion, we find uh, that uh, the momentum of the particle uh, with the boost gamma m not b equals exactly or very similar to h bar k, which is drawn here by dashed lines. This is very similar to what we see here as the average, average motion of this uh, particle. And here you can see a uh, in this inset, you can see a zoom in of this, uh, again, uh, high frequency oscillations. At first, we, we don't see anything, but then we see those oscillations that arise. Uh, this is nice. If we, if we take one snapshot of this, um, of this free, particle, uh, free particle motion and, uh, and strobe it, we can see this uh, um, trajectory of the strobe particles. This is the motion of the strobe particles. It's not a straight line. It, again, it oscillates. But most interesting here is this trace uh, or signature that this particle leaves, which seems infinite, right? So this particle that moves here actually leaves an, uh, a signature which can affect non-locally on other things, uh, other particles, or itself, which is interesting. So spatial temporal non-locality is visible through those phantom particles, I'm calling them, which can be important if we do the same for the double slit uh, experiment, for, for example. We didn't do it yet. And definitely should do that. Um, OK, so we continue here and uh, analyze the system. Uh, here on the left, you can see uh, uh, the spectral, the uh, spatial spectrum of the particle motion. So uh, we track the particle and basically do a spatial FFT and gets its uh, wave numbers, right? And we can see if we compare the wave number to the Broglie's uh, wave number, we can see a rather um, noisy spectrum, but this high energy um, arises around one, uh, very close to one. And uh, this uh, suggesting that uh, um, the Broglie uh, frequency is excited here, or the Broglie, the Broglie wavelength or wave number is excited here. Uh, this is definitely not a monochromatic, uh, not monochromatic system but maybe we can call it a quasi-monochromatic system because in terms of uh, power spectrum density, uh, it's highest around one. And uh, here again, we can see the Broglie's wavelength arising from uh, the phase space. Here we can see the uh, particle speed um, changes with, um, with space. Now, if you look at the temporal frequency now, Again, an FFT of this particle motion, but a temporal one. So here we have reduced frequency omega over omega c, and here again the energy. Uh, so we can, what we can see is very interesting. So we excite the system at twice constant frequency uh, to parametrically uh, excite the frequency. This is a Zitterbewegung that we uh, have as an input to the system. Uh, and we expect to see um, a rise at the natural frequency or at omega c. We don't see it. Instead, we see uh, this, this sideband uh, arising. Uh, when we analyze this, we get exactly uh, this relation. So omega um, is the square root of one uh, plus minus this, uh, uh, basically the frequency kc, okay? And Kc, if you remember from uh, Einstein's uh, energy equation, uh, it's exactly omega c squared plus k squared c squared. This is, uh, uh, this is actually the modulation uh, frequency due to this motion of this particle. So using this model, uh, we were able to both 
uh, capture the velocity modulation at the De Broglie wavelength, you can see here. Uh, basically, uh, essentially uh, giving us P, H, P equals H bar K, but also the temperature, uh, temporal signature that corresponds to the relativistic modulation frequency of Kc. Um, yeah, so now, uh, now this, th this simulation or this uh, analysis comes from only one particle uh, trajectory. But what happens if we take a lot of trajectories? Um, so here is this again a temporal, uh, spatial temporal map. This is now this is time and this is uh, space. And at first we see an initial harmonic motion here. But uh, the symmetry is broken, as you could see in the single trajectory. Now we have a lot of trajectories. Um, but if we take the PDF, the particle uh, statistics of, uh, of our model, of our HQFT, um, so we take the PDF of 1,000 runs. You see only 50 here. Um, uh, what we can see is this. So this is a particle PDF. Uh, with respect to time. So here, obviously, we only have exactly uh, a Gaussian distribution, as you can see here. But with time, we have this dispersion. And, uh, and then if we do the same for um, uh, analytical uh, Gaussian response uh, to the Klein-Gordon, without any particle, we get this. So this is very similar, not the same, uh, but, uh, but we definitely see uh, uh, similar behavior. Uh, so, we so statistics uh, could emerge from the ensemble of, uh, of multiple particles here. So we can ask, can we relate the emergent statistics in the real world to the ensemble interpretation? Uh, from what we can see here. Uh, and so here I have, uh, I have uh, some uh, uh, um, other um, computations we did for a force particle. Now, the first thing we tried is a simple harmonic oscillator. Here the coupling constant alpha um, connecting the particle trajectory to, to the wave field is uh, almost zero, it's very small. And when alpha is small, uh, so here again, we have a particle uh, in a restoring force field, this one, okay? So we put a particle not at zero, otherwise we wouldn't have anything. So we put it here somewhere around 20 lambda over lambda C, um, and then it has a force. So we don't really have to induce some uh, perturbations here the particle just moves by itself, okay? And uh, here for a relatively low spring constant, we just have an harmonic, a classical, a very classical harmonic uh, uh, behavior, harmonic oscillator. Uh, when we increase this uh, spring constant, uh, we can start to see um, classical relativistic trajectories. So this form here, is a characteristics of a classical relativistic trajectory. By classical, I mean without any quantum effects. And this is for low coupling constants uh, between the these two, two equations, uh, the, uh, dynamic equation in the waves. What happens if we increase this constant? Then we, we can see another. Uh, so this is, uh, again, low alpha, almost zero. And this is high alpha. Um, low alpha converges to the um, uh, to the actual solution of um, of the relativistic harmonic oscillator. High alpha, we get this. Uh, uh, first of all, the waves. Uh, look at those waves. Um, uh, this this field is distorted now by the particle. It's not that clean and, uh, and, and it's distorted because of this uh, nonlinear interaction between the particle and the wave. It's a two-way two -way coupling now, okay? And when we increase the alpha spatial temporal map here, we can see those um, uh, wobbling motion, which gives rise, this is the PDF of the particle, to some quantizations that we can see here. So we increase alpha, we can start to see those uh, quantized uh, states. 
Um, do I have uh, time, uh, Charles, or is it? Uh, yes, you're doing uh, good on time. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, to summarize this part of the talk, um, we have the high dynamic analog, the HQA and HQFT, uh, the new um, model. So we want to uh, compare those two. Again, same same uh, pictures. Uh, so the driving force in HQA is actually the bath vibration. Okay, so we vibrate the bath, and this is the our driving force. And of course, we have the bouncing droplet uh, due to this bath vibration, which creates creates this uh, this wave. Without the bath bath vibration, we wouldn't have anything in the system. Uh, which is probably the same in, uh, uh, definitely the same in HQFD, but probably the same in nature or vacuum fluctuations or whatever energy is uh, coming from that, uh, uh, that makes uh, those particles oscillate, which is as it will be vacant. Uh, driving frequency is twice the Faraday frequency in HQA and twice the Compton frequency in our um, model. Particle vibration is the droplet bouncing and due to the vacuum. Um, waves are Faraday waves uh, in HUA and meta waves, uh, Klein-Gordon waves in our case, um, but we can definitely think of other uh, waves to explore. Um, other notable things is this. So pilot wavelength uh, is the Faraday wavelength. On the other hand, here we have in HUFT, we have two wavelengths. We have uh, oscillations uh, around the Compton frequency and at the De Broglie frequency that we see. The special relation we talked about, not exactly the same, but results in uh, uh, very similar uh, behavior. And I guess uh, John will talk more about this, uh, his talk. Uh, so now, now I want to show you the, the last um, uh, um, part in, in this talk, which is a fully classical interpretation for, which shows some relativistic uh, dynamics. Um, so in, in this work, which, uh, which has been done by my student Idan uh, here in the lab, uh, we still look at the klein gordian equation, but we normalize everything. So we don't really talk about the speed of light. Uh, we talk about a wave equation here and uh, basically look at um, what the waves, uh, which still have the same um, natural frequency here. Uh, and we still oscillate this uh, or, or perturb the system uh, with the Gaussian, oscillating Gaussian. But um, for the dynamic equation, we are not taking into account any relativistic um, uh, considerations here. So just a new Newtonian uh, simple dynamic equation for the particle, only now, uh, which can have some uh, forcing terms here, which is uh, simple to, implore, uh, to implement because we don't care about uh, relativistic um, constraints anymore. But uh, we still have this uh, wave, um, so gradient-driven um, uh, forcing term uh, coming from the waves. So we couple those two equations. And so we explored the fully classical analog here. Uh, we wrote uh, two different uh, numerical codes, uh, finite differences and spectral codes. Uh, uh, just for some verification and uh, they work really well. Uh, we do 1D and 2D simulations, and this is just an example. Um, at the first look, uh, I don't know if you can actually, so this is a special temporal map again, but only, only the particles trajectories are, for, uh, are showing. Many trajectories are shown here, but if you closely look at this, um, uh, those oscillations, the velocity of the particles is actually mostly so columnal, um, which is probably not acceptable if you talk uh, if you talk about uh, uh, regular uh, physical uh, uh, interpretation for for a particle. But here we don't have any constraints, so no problem. Um, 
Uh, this is a classical analogy. Um, other things uh, that are interesting here, uh, we have a huge separation of scales as we did in HQFT. So for example, for H HQFT, um, I just want to give you the, the numbers here. So a uh, quantum corral that we saw here, uh, the diameter here is roughly, if I'm not wrong, 150 angstroms. Um, the electron Compton wavelength, which, uh, which we resolve, um, is 5,000 times larger than this one. Um, I'm sorry, this, this domain is 5,000 times larger than the Compton uh, wavelength. Uh, and, and so we approximate that the domain needed is uh, roughly more than a million uh, times the Compton uh, wavelength. Now, these are the simulation we're doing right now. And we think we need to, um, in order to actually resolve statistics, right? So converse statistics of, of this ensemble of particles, we should run um, thousands and thousands of simulations. Uh, another problem is that in, in, in this quantum corral, if we look at the De Broglie waves, we can actually estimate the, uh, the um, average um, velocity of, the, of those um, free electrons. And collecting statistics for uh, this uh, low velocity of 0.1c is huge, uh, computationally expensive. So we run this in a cluster uh, in our lab. Uh, so we have a high performance uh, cluster of uh, about 1,000 cores. And uh, it takes time, uh, still takes time. And uh, we, we, we still don't uh, resolve this case, only this. Only this um, uh, domain is uh, roughly 200 uh, lambda C, takes about a day to run uh, in a cluster. So it's a very expensive uh, computation. Uh, okay, so uh, I wanted to show you something uh, uh, interesting here. So what would happen if we look at different particles moving at different speeds? in the classical interpretation. So here, this is a particle which is just oscillating uh, about zero. This is space again, so you know, uh, uh, X labels here. So this is space and this is time. And these are the waves. And here you can see the particle color coded by uh, its uh, velocity, right? So this is a slow particle. And this is a faster particle, right? So a faster particle, uh, classical particle, um, we can see it's uh, oscillations here, interesting, and you can see that the particle is definitely can move at superluminal speeds, forward and backward, forward and back. Okay, uh, gravi gradient driven by the waves. Now, if you increase this uh, particle uh, speed, you can see this increased, and further increased, we have this increase, and. I can increase and increase. Um, I don't have any proof, but uh, this particle is uh, changing its uh, characteristics. So this I have a proof, but um, uh, if, if we increase further the, uh, the velocity of the particle through forcing, I believe this particle will converge to the speed of light, reducing its uh, oscillations. Uh, still, I don't have any proof that it happens, but we see many. Um, uh, ev so we see evidence that it does happen. If we, uh, so right now we can cross the uh, light cone, but if we, uh, but then uh, we, if, if we um, uh, do a sensitivity test uh, and uh, tighten up our numerics, it just goes back to uh, within this light cone. So this is an ongoing work. Um, exciting for us. And this is what we see. If you increase beta, if you increase the uh, average velocity of a particle, you can see that the oscillations are reducing um, with uh, the speed. Uh, and we believe it will reduce to zero, or close to zero, or about the speed of light or the analogies, uh, analogy of the speed of light. Um, 
so what we can actually see here is a contraction of uh, contraction of uh, length uh, of um, inline oscillation where, uh, length. Uh, but also the frequency is changing. Um, so this is still, um, we still explore, uh, explore the system, but we see a very similar um, uh, behavior as we saw in HGFT. Uh, we also have um, an analytical approach here where this is an exact solution uh, for the coupled equation, but uh, we assume many things. Uh, so we solve here the response of an oscillating particle to a stationary wave field. Uh, why stationary wave field? Again, because we know uh, we get this from HQA. So about uh, stationary wave field, we get excitations, analytically excitations of particles. Uh, note that those excitations are reducing again inline oscillations also in this uh, analytical formulation reduce um, uh, with the increase of velocity. Uh, finally, I want to show something that is very much related to um, the question of uh, Robert, which is indications of wave induced inertia. Uh, so here we have uh, again the, the same, so same wave equation forced, but, but now we force it with a constant uh, force. Uh, this is for alpha zero. So alpha zero, no particle wave interactions at all. The only thing, oh, I'm sorry, there, there is a, the, only one way coupling. Particles are creating waves. Waves are not affecting the particle, okay? So we're moving the particle at the constant uh, forcing, which is, um, uh, which gives us no inertia, no inertia here. So this is this is the this is the equation we solve. We neglect this uh, inertial term. Okay, this is the equation we solve. Uh, so obviously the particle moves like this. Now here we stop the force. So it just no inertia. It, it, it's not. It doesn't continue. Okay. So we stop the forcing here, and then this is just a standing wave. It creates. So, reasonable. What happens if we do uh, put some uh, uh, wave coupling here? Well, small wave coupling of a four, uh, roughly the same, okay? So what's going to be interesting is this, high alpha, high wave coupling, okay? So here we have a high speed, then we stop here. We stop the forcing. Uh, this line should be, should have been here, sorry, should have been here. We stop the forcing, the particle. So now because the uh, alpha alpha is high, look at this equation, this is gone. We stop the forcing, the particle is bounced uh, to the other side, but eventually due to uh, the waves, the particle created, right? Uh, so non-locality, due to those waves, the particle uh, again moves at roughly the same speed. So indication of inertia, uh, maybe, without an inertial term uh, coming from uh, the wave field and particle wave history. Uh, so with this, I want to conclude. Uh, we have a new model for quantum dynamics based on the conception of De Broglie and informed by hydronomic uh, pilot wave system. This is our HQFT, uh, which explicitly treats the coupling between the particle and wave. Um, uh, we see that this, uh, uh, this coupling exhibit, uh, exhibits the emergence of waves consistent with uh, P equals H bar K, and also modulation, um, modulations, uh, relativistic modulations of the frequency. And our ongoing work now, uh, we have the force, uh, force particle simulations of uh, HQFT um, in a simple harmonic oscillator, uh, and also constant potentials. We explore different classical wave fields. And um, um, in preparation now is the new classical non relativistic interpretation for free particles, which reveals um, some relativistic quantum statistics. So, with this, I really want to thank you and thank you, Charles and Kate, for inviting me uh, to this uh, wonderful workshop. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Yuval. Uh, 
thanks for sharing your work with everyone and all your new results as well. That's very exciting uh, to see that. And the, this, um, you know, of course, it's natural to think of the analogy between uh, the De Broglie oscillations and the quantum vacuum and uh, how uh, the coupling between the two can lead to many effects and, you know, tell us why P equals H bar K now, right? And instead of just uh, uh, hypothesizing that or putting that down, hey, P equals H bar K, hey, maybe this is where that comes from, which is a very exciting result, I'd say. Uh, so. Yeah, I know we have a, a few questions. I think if you look in the, the, the chat, um, or maybe Eric can um, uh, Eric can speak up. He knows he thinks why uh, your classical results uh, occur. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Eric. Uh, sure. Well, you know uh, Herman House was a professor uh, of uh, electrical engineering at MIT. I think he passed away in the '90s, but he uh, he found that. Um, for an extended charge distribution, um, you know, you know, anything that'll accelerate this charge will will radiate. But he found that for any extended continuous charge distribution, if the Fourier transform of the of the of the spacetime components uh, are synchronous with the speed of light, then that's when you have radiation. Uh, radiation will only occur. When those uh, when those four A components are synchronous with the speed of light, where the, the wave number equals uh, the you know the, the the frequency over C, and uh, and therefore in your, um, your your temporal signature corresponds it says in the slide here to the uh, modulation frequency omega equals kc, and mm -hmm. so. The re I think the reason, so if you just apply that, uh, that radiation um, uh, analog to the, to the particle, if, if, you, if you take that Fourier transform, you will, you will find that you will not have components that are synchronous with the speed of, with the speed of light, or in your, in your case, your simulated speed of light, you see, because mm -hmm. your particle is not radiating. It's, it's not generating any uh, components that can travel faster than that boundary that you have, which you'll see. True. Uh, it's, called the, it's called the radiation, the Hermann House uh, uh, condition for radiation. Uh, I, you know, I, you're at MIT, I think you're at MIT, so you probably go right to the MIT library and, and find you know, some of his, his handwritten notes even. I will, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super interesting. I, I didn't think about this uh, um, radiation theory. Um, uh, com uh, so, and in this in this sense, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's, it's an analog, right? It's, it's right, but I think I think it works because you are uh, you're essentially um, reproducing that uh, classically. You know, the, your particle is not radiating, but in, in a sense, it is. It's bouncing on, um, you know, it's bouncing on water or oil. And it's generating waves. So, so um, you've all, could you comment on the non-locality um, that you mentioned? Now that it, that's different than a quantum entanglement non-locality. It's a, um, that the wave affects things away from itself. And so has effects that are not local to it but it's not like an instantaneous, uh, how we think of quantum mechanics as an entangled things and instantly changing. And is, oh, that, certainly. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Yes, yes, Charles, uh, it's exactly right. So uh, the term non-locality, if you, uh, it's definitely not uh, in the usual or regular sense that a uh, term that is used by, uh, by non-local, uh, interactions in uh, quantum mechanics, but what we see is non-local behavior in the sense that the particle 
signature actually replicates itself in space. And, and, then, and then the particle that moves, it's actually moving with its signature in space as, as those waves that are addressing this particle are also affected by the particle motion. So we actually see this motion uh, non-local. So the particle which was a local entity, entity, at least localized, not exactly local, right? It was a Gaussian, um, but it was localized. We now can see um, uh, instead of one trajectory, through those waves, we can see a lot of trajectories coming about uh -huh. from those waves. And uh, John Bush and his group, they showed phantom particles, uh, as, as you can see in, 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 uh, in quantum corals, uh, which, which seems like a non-local uh, effect, but, but you're right. It's, it's, it's not exactly the non-locality of entanglement, of course not. At least we didn't show something like that. Right, yeah. but it kind of shows the connection of everything to everything else. Uh, yeah, and 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 it travels at the speed of light. So if if you if, if the particle moves and it carries with uh, uh, with it uh, its own signature, which is not damped in space, then it's definitely non-local. I think. What yes. do you mean by sign? What do you mean by signature? Uh, yeah, so I, I stopped the sharing. Maybe I may share, I share it again, Robert. So, um, so when I showed this, so I have this simulation now, right? When a particle creates those waves, but is also um, propelled by its own wave field, okay? Now, if we take a closer look around somewhere here, then this is the instantaneous snapshot, which is not revealing much. But if we stroke this, uh, it's just phase locking it basically, right? At different uh, at the Compton frequency. Then can you see those? Uh, so it's very very fading. It's fading actually, right? But it seems like we can actually see the particle traces um, following following the particle itself. So this is what. Uh, I'm referring to as uh, some non-local effects. Okay, so uh, this, and, is an this, actual, this is an actual, an actual thing. thing. Was that sorry? This is an actual thing. This is a an actual uh, matter energy type of existing thing. It's not a uh, it's not a contrived or a, or, a, or a type of thing. No, of course not. This is a deterministic simulation. Right. Right. It's just it's just a coupling between two equations. That's it. A very simple ones, by the way. Have you been able to run more than one particle at once to see how those yeah. interactions interact? <laughs> the phantom particles, or it's you know. on the checklist. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> next, next uh, project. Next project. Okay. I actually have a student looking at this exactly this, but uh -huh. uh, she's just starting now. I see. Yeah, that'll be very interesting to see. Yeah. Any, did you hear um, Stephen Wolfram's talk at all, by chance, Yuval? Uh, no, un unfortunately not. So uh, the yeah, problem, not. I, I definitely will because it's uh, late in the evening here. So, so Right, right. No, I know. Yeah, that would have been like super late when he, he talked. Um, but I wonder if there's any relation to his... Um, you know, each event cascading down and interacting. And I, I don't know, I see some relation there to this analysis and that. I don't know if I'm just uh, grasping at straws there, but anyway, okay. I'm sorry, I, I'll have to catch up with this uh, video. Yes. You have this, uh, the video online, right? Yeah, it's online already, yes. Definitely check this out. But I think we have time for one more uh, question. Um, the, uh, Robert has his hand up. I don't know if you asked your question already. I would just like a, a clarification of why and when we use the term phantom. I'm dealing with phantom Z that arises from, uh, you know, an X cross bar, Y in, a, say, a, an Euler equation or an EM, going from a 2D mysteriously, this, this, this uh, Z vector jumps out to the 3D. We use phantom there. We use phantom when we're dealing with uh, 
uh, rotational where we have two that are the same and then one is different. And then magically that phantom word comes up. So I'd like to understand you, Val, uh, basically mm -hmm. what, what do you mean when you use the word phantom and why are you using that word phantom? Yeah, so, so here it's uh, the, simply, simply because I was, I was looking at this uh, excitation in my simulation. This is what I prescribe, right? So the particle is free to move, right? But I'm tracking this Gaussian, this Gaussian oscillation um, in time, and I know where it is, right? So this for me is a particle, right? or an, a disturbance that is oscillating in time and space. But those are, are some effects that looks like a particle, right? So I, 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 do have some, I do have some signatures here that really look like the trajectories of a particle. So I just call them a phantom, phantom effect. Uh, in, the, in the elliptic corals, for example, and you, you'll be able to see that in, um, uh, I guess, in uh, uh, John's talk in an elliptic corral, uh, you can uh, place a particle, also in quantum mechanics, you can place a particle at the focal uh, of, of the ellipse, right? And, and you actually get a similar particle emerging um, at the other focal. So uh, they call this a uh, phantom uh, particle as well, because uh, they didn't put anything there, but another particle emerged from the field. So this is actually what I think is going on here. Does it answer the question? Maybe. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It sounds like you're using phantom moments like a ghost. Oh, yeah. No, it looks like a ghost. So that's why. <laughs> mm -hmm. OK, well, thank you uh, again, Yuval. Um, I think uh, we better move on to the next talk. Uh, I'm going to, I just found out about this reaction thing, so I'm going <laughs> to, yay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much.